Good evening. Um, in fact, I would like to, um, to start with a quote. Um, I'd like to um, tell you a statement by Amnesty International from two days ago that says on Egypt, it is currently more dangerous to criticize the Egyptian government than at any time in the country's recent history. Egyptians living under President Assisi are treated as criminals simply for peacefully expressing their opinion. Now, this statement was given two days ago when Amal Fathi, a uh, woman human rights defender, was, um, was sentenced for two years of prison because she openly spoke out about sexual harassment, and we'll talk about this issue later. Now, um, why am I saying this one, that we really wanted to have an Egyptian activist here with us on the panel? but then decided that it is simply um, too dangerous. And second, because the subject, of course, um, touches one of the, the issues that we want to talk about. I mean, we want to talk about um, connecting resistances, about authoritarianism and resistance, the counter-revolution and new authoritarianism, and in fact, um, some of the crisis that the region of West Asia and North Africa is facing. We will definitely not be able to talk about it all, but at the moment we see armed conflict, still patriarchy, of course, the impact of neoliberal economies, and also European migration and security policies that strengthen authoritarian regimes and weaken emancipatory forces. And now we want to look at these intersecting crises, or at least at some of them, definitely on neoliberal policies and the interlinkage between gender and authoritarianism. And we will also want to talk about solidarity, about the possibilities for transnational and or translocal solidarity. Um, so I'm very happy to present our speakers on this panel to you. On my very left is uh, Saeed Al Batal from uh, Tartus in Syria. He's a citizen journalist, a photographer, and a filmmaker. We have very creative people with us during the last two days, I discovered. Um, Saeed led several trainings in journalism and photography, and he worked as a reporter for various radio stations and agencies and institutions worldwide. He's one of the founders of an online gallery and um, Humans of Syria project. Then next slide is Angela Joya. She's assistant professor at the Department of International Studies at the University of Oregon. Her research focuses on neoliberal policies and the ways this phenomenon shapes the relationships among various social classes, the institutions and practices of the state. And she has researched also the impact of uh, neoliberalization and privatization on workers' and peasants' livelihoods in the post-1990 period. Her other research interests include current migrant refugee crisis in the Mediterranean, Islamist social movements, and contentious politics. And she has focused regionally on Egypt, Palestine, uh, Jordan, Turkey, and recently also on Tunisia, right? Um, Nizar Hassan, who is next um, to, between Angela and Nadia, is um, a Lebanese activist and researcher. He um, wrote his dissertation on the 2015 protest movement in, um, in Lebanon. And uh, he currently works for the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies in Beirut. And he also works on voter behavior for Liha'i, a political group that he co-founded uh, before the um, uh, Lebanese elections in 2018, this year in, in May. Um, Nizar co-hosts the Lebanese Politics Podcast, a 40-minute English language podcast. And next to Nizar is um, Professor Nadia Al Ali. Nadia is a um, professor of gender studies still at the Center for Gender Studies at the South University in London, but she'll soon um, move uh, to Brown University where she'll hold a position in anthropology with reference to the Middle East. 
Her main research interests revolve around feminist activism and gendered mobilization, mainly with reference to Iraq, Egypt, Turkey, and the Kurdish political movement, and most recently, Lebanon. She is widely published, but I will skip all this now. And uh, will just tell you that her more recent research and publications focus on the Turkish Kurdish conflict and the Kurdish women's movement and also queer feminist activism in Beirut. Nadia is not only um, an academic but also an activist. She um, has been involved in various local and transnational organizations and campaigns and was also a founding member of Act Together Women's Action for Iraq. Um, so we have agreed now that we will have a first round of um, questions where I will give all of them like five minutes uh, to, to develop um, a bit broader on the, on the question on challenges and for um, progressive resistance in various contexts of the region. And um, we've decided to start with uh, Said. So Said will speak about the situation in Syria, what it is like now, and what maybe in the future could be um, possibilities also for left organizing. Yeah? yeah. Thank you all for coming. Like I'm so pleased to see so many people are interested. And uh, I hope this be informal for you and uh, as important as we feel it is. Uh, to, to start to talk about Syria, uh, it's so complicated. This is the common answer that we always get. But like to simplify it, I would say it's a country living under dictatorship for 48 years now. And uh, eight years ago, the, uh, inspired by the Arabic Spring, we uh, movement have started in Syria and then developed to become a big revolution and then now by Wikipedia definition it's a civil war. Uh, to, but to simplify it, it's a movement against a dictatorship. But to, if we want to zoom in, there's where the devil lies and where to go to the details it's so complicated. So what I'm gonna do is just simply cut the last six months and talk about this uh, from the perspective of on the ground movement, not from the perspective of the political news because you can get that anywhere else. Uh, to be simple, uh, the last uh, six to, uh, months was like very, very difficult for all uh, the rebels in Syria and all the revolutionary movements because after Russia interfered in 2015 and up to the last six months, they have waged war like have never been seen before in Syria with a huge amount of weapons that they are so proud to talk about. They have experimented multiple hundreds of new weapons on us and uh, eventually they managed to uh, one by one take all of the resistant cities from the control of the rebels and move them uh, against their will, all of them, to Idlib. So now the situation now uh, is uh, all, ar all, around, all about Idlib from the rebel point of view because all the civil movements in Syria have been collected from all Syria and uh, thrown to Idlib. Now we have like four million people living between Idlib and North, and North Aleppo, while the rest of the country, we can say it's under the control, both Russians, Iranians, and last Syrian regime. Um, to be uh, really honest, it's a very delicate period of time for multiple reasons. I would like to specify some of them. We can like really speak that this is a very important moment, especially for the left wing to act, because after eight years, uh, all the Islamic cards have been played in Syria. People in Syria have seen how they fail, and they fail strongly. Start with the radical Islamists, up to the even uh, uh, new, I don't know, new liberal Islamists, if that's a, if <laughs> they all have been, it's, it's all have been tried, and it's all have been proven to be failed. So people, uh, since, uh, Two months ago, because of the deal that Turkish have done with the Russians and seized uh, the airstrikes, and immediately after the airstrikes stop, uh, all the demonstrations and all the liberated city came back to street. Uh, last week, we had 104 uh, protest uh, point in in uh, Idlib and North Aleppo alone. Uh, that means that almost every city and every village went to street. Uh, in Friday, this is the uh, 
uh, usual occasions when it's happened and it's still going and they are back to naming Fridays and people are in the streets uh, we have we see now that uh, the what are you called the green flag which is the Syrian independent flag that was adopted by the revolution uh, is now back on the streets we don't see any more Islamic flags and that's what I see, well, that's why I, I say it's a very important moment because now if we uh, stand with them it's if we support them they have space the left the leftists in Syria they have space and they have the knowledge and the experience especially after eight years to do actually do some good work on the ground and uh, this is why it's a very important meeting and this is why it's a very important period of time also because we see all around the world how it's becoming more and more right-wing and how the right-wing is global uh, and how they are now becoming one force, one force and we need to stand against that especially that uh, in the next few uh, months and years it's not going to be about guns it's going to be about political movements, and it's going to be all about political resistance, especially with ha with having so much countries on the ground, uh, uh, with uh, the Turkish protecting Idlib, and with the Russians stop stopping stopping their airstrikes. So we have we have the chance to really do something. And uh, I know that you all, of, all get so bored, bored of Syria, and I know that all of you uh, during the last eight years heard nothing but Syria on the news, but uh, it's also not just to, uh, Syria and, and to talk about it over and over again for no reason. It's just because people are there, literally are fighting to the death to the, for their rights. And I think it's, uh, if we don't stand with them, it's not just like solidarity. If we don't stand with them, it's just, we eventually the t turn gonna come to us. And thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you, Saeed. I mean, there is a lot to be added and 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 and, and questions to be asked. So, but we now take a turn and then come come back to to Syria later and I would now like to ask Angela tomorrow with your background on migration politics on neoliberal policies to give us a like a broader view on where you see what are the current challenges that progressive actors face or the issues that they that they take up and and and, and protest against so if you can give us a set the context a little bit for our discussion there Sure. Uh, thank you, Tanya, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really happy to speak about these issues, and I um, hope we will have a bigger discussion, uh, contributions from the rest of you later on. Um, so um, to uh, think about challenges that are qu quite multifaceted in the region, um, uh, each country has got its own set of challenges. Um, and we think about the last seven and a half years since the uprisings. It is seven and a half years now. Um, when the uprisings happened, there were particular demands across the region, but they resonated with one another. Um, demands for social rights, economic rights, political rights, uh, social justice, uh, freedom to speak, um, freedom to mobilize and organize. Um, there were also specific um, demands that uh, basically moved beyond the specific countries. Um, in Tunisia and Egypt, there was a demand by uh, the popular forces to drop the debt, the, the debt that the countries owe to international financial institutions. Um, so just to get a sense of all the demands that happened seven and a half years ago and where they are now. Um, now, in the last seven and a half years, uh, things have changed in the region. Um, the wars in Libya, uh, the civil war, the conflict in Syria, um, have definitely had an impact on the way that the states in places like Tunisia, like Egypt and Morocco or Algeria respond to the demands of their citizens. Um, so that has been quite influential domestically um, in the way uh, that these demands have been met or not met um, and the resistance from the states towards the citizens. Um, but I wanted to also uh, point out the role of um, global institutions and how uh, while we think because the revolutions happened perhaps these international financial institutions that had shaped um, the conditions that led to the uprisings might have backed down or backed out uh, to a certain extent or changed course uh, because they saw that 
popular masses demanded something different. Um, unfortunately, they have been pushing uh, the same agenda on all these countries continuously. Um, there has been from various governments, and for instance in Tunisia, um, push back, and similarly in Algeria, push back against these policies where the governments have tried to respond to a certain extent to their citizens, like um, issues of subsidies. They have tried to reinstate subsidies on uh, foods and other consumer goods. Um, but some of these um, have been seen uh, with huge criticism by international financial institutions. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the region is still somewhat trapped in that framework of new liberal policies um, that's determining the development policies of various countries um, uh, in the region. So that's one huge challenge that shapes the context and the contours uh, within which citizens are pressing their demands. Um, now, in, in the conference, uh, the talk I gave, I talked about this consolidation of neoliberal authoritarianism that um, happened before the uprisings, and so that was one of the major targets by uh, uh, protesters. And in some ways, that neoliberal authoritarian character of the state, um, that is political authoritarianism that's pushing neoliberal policies, has actually uh, persisted and uh, re-emerged in this post-uprising period. Um, having said that, um, later on hopefully we'll have a chance, I will talk about uh, their particular spaces within which citizens, citizens are still pushing, uh, um, pushing back against uh, some of the powers of the state and new liberal authorities uh, making particular demands. Um, and so there are these spaces of resistance um, that we will, we will get to hopefully in a bit. Uh, but nonetheless, in some of the other cases, um, uh, such as Tanya mentioned, the case of uh, 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 protesters and uh, activists, especially NGOs um, in Egypt, uh, there has been uh, increasingly shrinking of space uh, uh, where freedom of speech is really a diminishing good, uh, no longer uh, that available uh, for uh, activists uh, who are working um, at different levels. Um, Get that this channel two for Arabic. I heard. <laughs> so, uh, do I have a minute? Yes. Left? Okay. So, while I mentioned the complexity of the context in the region, um, some of the specific challenges that are on the agenda for various groups of citizens. Um, uh, I, I think at the top of it is unemployment. The issue of unemployment, that's because the uh, majority of the population in these countries, especially in North Africa, are youth. And so uh, there's a huge need for uh, creating jobs for them, uh, jobs that are also uh, sustainable jobs, not necessarily jobs that were created before, that were short-term contracts or low-wage jobs um, in special economic zones, for instance. Um, there's the issue of right to housing. And so I would speak a little bit about that as well, where um, there is now increasingly movements around demanding uh, rights to housing where housing was oftentimes privatized in these countries. So uh, there is this movement also, um, uh, but also increasingly a movement to organize and mobilize around independent unions. So in the case of um, farmers um, and other groups of citizens where they're trying to establish independent unions so that they could mobilize and press for their rights further against the state. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. So now And we'll move to Lebanon now. Um, sectarian politics, corruption, neoliberal policies, and nothing ever changes, but still there is protest. And we'll hear more about it from Nizar. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to see everyone's, uh, uh, everyone's interest um, in this topic. Um, uh, so. The case of Lebanon, obviously Lebanon is not an exception when it comes to uh, what Angela has been speaking about, about the neoliberal wave in the, in the region. However, the spe specific thing about Lebanon is the political structure that I'm sure almost everyone has heard of, which is the sectarian division of politics, the confessional system, uh, where the religious sect is not only um, what what divides people politically. It's also the primary mode of subjectification. It's the component of identity that matters in politics and that matters uh, in the amount of rights and benefits that you get from the states. Um, this sectarian system is controlled by a very small number of political leaders. And what this means is that um, 
the any movement uh, for reform has to start with this this uprising against the sectarian establishment and this is what we have been seeing every movement that starts with a specific topic then turns into something larger against the sectarian system. This is what happened in 2011 um, uh, as part of the Arab uprising uh, wave. And this is what happened in 2015, which, uh, as you said, I did my, my research about. Um, and in 2015, we saw that um, that uh, sectarianism is more complicated than the just a political system, that fighting it, um, that actually Having any social movement has to be taken uh, taken into consideration all these specificities of sectarianism. For example, uh, which which political figures to target, which not to target, um, how to mobilize, uh, how to approach the issues of sectarianism and secularism, uh, how to um, like as if citizens are turned into sectarian clients, then how can we mobilize these citizens without insulting their their uh, their subjectification as sectarian clients and the relationship with the political leaders. Um, and more importantly, uh, it opened a lot of questions about what kind of organizing, what kind of mobilization we can, we can do um, in this situation, and specifically how to um, go outside this bubble of professional activists, people who work in um, research and NGOs and uh, some media institutions who are always the ones in the streets uh, against everything, and how to, when you open this circle, when you go outside this bubble, how to keep the wider circle of uh, the population included in the movement, what structures to take, um, what kind of rhetoric to adopt. Uh, I think these were the, the mi biggest challenges for us. Also the fact that the economy in Lebanon is completely depoliticized. Uh, I can talk about the economy later, but it's a matter of, um, it's, it's like the political elite is, is happy with the economic system. Neoliberalism or ne the neoliberal hegemony in Lebanon is really strong. So any political rhetoric from independent groups is usually um, less economic than in most other maybe uh, contexts. And another thing is f the fact that also racism and structural racism um, against uh, foreign workers and against refugees alike is so entrenched in the system and people who are fighting against the system don't have this um, as the main component of their activism. And it's very difficult to challenge uh, the political rhetoric, the hegemonic rhetoric about refugees, like the case of Syrian refugees being in Lebanon or foreign workers, etc. So I don't know, am I done with the time or? You still have two minutes, actually. Okay, good. <laughs> nice. Um, so in Lebanon we had the, the, the movement in 2015 and this was this beginning of this new independent politics uh, uh, or kind of the boost. Uh, and then in 2016 we had the municipal elections where we saw new groups emerging. In the protest movements, uh, most of the groups were about ten, five to ten individual, individual activists who are all youth, all middle class, well educated youth who, are, who know how to use social media tools to mobilize and social media was at the center of it. In the municipal elections, we saw the emergence of another form of mobilization, specifically in Beirut with Beirut Medinati, the campaign that won 40% of the votes. It was a new phenomenon. It was the first time that we organized electorally and we, we actually challenged power in the elections. Um, and this was followed by the elections and the order of engineers and the order of, um, of uh, lawyers, but most importantly in the order of engineers as well, we, we had a victory there. And then the parliamentary elections, which I was also involved in, um, as Tanya said. And the parliamentary elections, the big question about how to organize, which I mentioned a bit um, a while ago, was the most important because we found that the mode of organizing that we created for the social, for the protest movements, the spontaneous uprising in the street, did not match uh, the needs of democratic struggle or like of, of electoral politics at all. So now what we're try what we're what we're involved in as activists in Beirut is in Lebanon is rethinking these structures and seeing how we can actually reach wider um, populations from different class backgrounds and geographical backgrounds uh, in the country. Okay, good last word. Thank you. Okay, then we continue with uh, Nadia. Nadia, you have done research on um, Iraq and Egypt and the Kurdish women in Turkey, recently also on Lebanon a bit. Can you draw from your research on the challenges you see for progressive actors and maybe what you name yourself, new forms of gendered activism? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think like Angela, um, it's always tricky to speak about um, the region without generalizing. And I think, you know, the different contexts, Lebanon, Egypt, uh, Egypt Iraq and Turkey, um, pose very different challenges, clearly. But there, there are a few um, sort of commonalities. And in addition to what um, everyone already said in terms of the increase or again, the re-emergence of uh, neoliberal authoritarianism, which in practice, of course, means incredible repressive regimes where it's not only in Egypt, but across, I mean, in Iraq as well. I mean, my friends and colleagues in Iraq say now that it's almost as bad as doing the Ba'ath regime in terms of even, in terms of speaking out. So, uh, you know, everywhere you look, political spaces are shrinking. Um, in the context of us, of you know, also we have this strange combination of incredibly repressive states, so two strong states, but also incredibly weak states who do not deliver any kind of basic services like healthcare, education, you know, basic infrastructure. And this is, of course, everywhere in the region, as Angela already pointed out, and also these are, you know, these are the issues that people are struggling for, you know, to have. Um, you know, like women to have access to proper health care and, um, and so on. But um, I think one of the points that um, I think I find very important to stress is that in the past we made this distinction very much between sort of secular and religious. And I think when we, we think about political authoritarianism, it really cuts across. Um, we find it in terms of various forms of um, Islamism and sectarianism, but we also find it in various forms of um, secular, mainly sort of military regimes. And one of the um, big challenges, uh, especially in terms of gender-based struggles, is militarization. Militarization not only in acute conflict, of course, like Syria or the Turkish-Kurdish struggle or in the Iraqi context, but militarization more broadly defined when a society gets more militarized, it means that there's a privileging of certain forms of masculinities, man the fighter. And we know from different studies across the globe, historically, cross-culturally, that there's a direct relationship between the kind of violence that people experience in acute conflict in a war situation and what's happening at home and on the street in terms of domestic violence and gender-based violence. And we don't just have to go to the Middle East, uh, we can go to the United States to see the relationship in terms of the war veterans and the increases in domestic violence. Um, now, a further problem, I mean, we're in Germany, so uh, we talked a lot uh, the last two days in, in the workshop about the impact of EU policy. I mean, I'm based in London and I'm very, very upset that Brexit is going to happen. But of course, there are problems with the EU and EU policies. When we think about the way that um, the EU actually conceptualizes gender mainstreaming and women's empowerment in the Middle East. It's a very, very neoliberal and neoconservative definition. It's like, you know, women, business women, women in leadership positions, training women, you know, to become uh, leaders. Um, and so uh, that has not been very helpful uh, and has in many ways actually even corrupted some women's organizations. I mean, I was very concerned in Iraqi Kurdistan, where, you know, initially I was very impressed with some women's rights activism, and I don't want to generalize, but I found that the professionalization and careerism of, you know, being a women's rights activist, which is a sort of direct response to the foreign funding and the, the ways that um, gender empowerment is being um, conceptualized. Um, having said that, there are um, I mean, I was uh, very impressed um, to speak with new generations of feminists. I mean, I started out doing my research and was involved in the Egyptian women's movement in the 90s. And that generation grew out of, uh, or you know, the generations that were active in the 90s grew out of women who had been part of the student movement, the leftist movement, and were just fed up with men basically telling them to make tea. And they started to organize independently. Uh, but they were often, you know, quite reluctant to call themselves feminists because feminists you associate a Western uh, lesbian woman who hates men. I mean, that was a definition that was given, and that's not also unique to the Middle East. But we also have that, of course, in the West, this, um, you know, stereotype. Um, 
But now the new generation of feminists in the region, particularly, I mean, in the context of um, Egypt and Lebanon, they're actually very critical of this NGOization of women's rights activism. Uh, they're much more creative. They're thinking about new forms of organizing. It's very different from the Iraqi context. In the Iraqi context, NGOs are still the way to go. Uh, there's no critique, really, of um, funding... Um, uh, the agendas of funding bodies like USAID are very, very limited. And so there is also that creates a kind of um, competition amongst uh, many Iraqi women's rights organizations. Having said that, they have been at the forefront of actually challenging sectarianism and authoritarianism um, in Iraq. And I also should say that in the Turkish context, you know, anyone who's seen International Women's Day in a context where it is, I mean, so repressive, but feminists still went out on International Women's Day and protested, and they are at the forefront together with LGBTQ activists, um, not only in terms of the repressive state, but also to highlight the atrocities against the Kurdish population in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, Nadia? My time is up. You, your time is up, but then... <laughs> Your, your time is up, but then I will ask you to speak again because I'm planning to take the round now the other way and ask more specific questions. Actually, my question would go into a bit of a different direction, but um, I think this topic is very important and, and you write, wrote about it. It's about body politics and I have mentioned before this Amal Fathri, the woman human rights defender who was who sur survived sexual harassment and was um, sort of sentenced uh, two days ago, so it's a very um, um, topic uh, that needs to be discussed. Now, you argue that the body of women and men alike actually has become a key site of contestation and control, in particular in the recent years after 2011. Now, sexual harassment and also the prosecution of especially transgender people, I mean, all those who don't fit into the norm have, has increased in many countries in the region since the beginning of the uprisings. I mean, I mean, and we witnessed the brutal crackdown of the LGBTIQ community in Egypt, especially um, against transgender people, those who don't fit into the norm. So, so I would like to ask you, what, what can you make the link? What is the link between authoritarianism and body control? Why do we need to control? The body. Well, I mean, the authoritarian state is essentially patriarchal state. I mean, patriarchy is at the center. So when I say patriarchy, I mean the rule of male elder. And patriarchy is also built on the idea, very binary, of um, man, woman, and gender role, and very defined gender roles, what women should do and what men should do, and of course also heteronormativity. So. Um, I mean, while we use the term body politics, now it's kind of maybe a sort of a trendy term, but actually what it means, the recognition that the body is really at the center of the family, the society, and the state, and so is also at the center of the resistance to the family, society, and the state, that's not new. I mean, in the region, for instance, um, feminist activists across the region have been campaigning to change the personal status code which is the laws that um, govern marriage, divorce, child custody, and inheritance. I think that was sort of early forms of body politics. Uh, many women in the region have been campaigning for reproductive rights, uh, access to healthcare, and so on. But more recently, I think it's become more central because in some ways, um, you know, I guess it's become mo most visible in the Egyptian context where the female protester was kind of the sim symbol par excellence for an order that was threatened. And so, um, yes, I mean, at some point, you know, Sisi came out and said, oh, you know, of course we have to protect our women, but really the good girl doesn't go out. Um, so it was a very, very uh, conservative, patriarchal reaction to um, harassment. And we see now that, of course, um, that is very much seen. I mean, women actually challenging the system and coming out and speaking about harassment, speaking about gender-based violence, is very much threatening the patriar patriarchal order. Um, and so, 
Uh, it is both, I would say, I mean, as I've argued, it is women's bodies and women's sexuality, what women wear, their dress code and their mobility, but increasingly it's also men who do not fi fit the norm by virtue of their sexuality. So gay men and of course transgender people across the region are also targeted. Sometimes, I mean, in the Egyptian context, there's a long history of the regime actually using the sex panic to distract from other issues <laughs> that we've seen it in the 90s. And, but now I think it's more than that because I think the sex and gender panic is actually at the center of the panic of the authoritarian state. And at the same time, the resistance against the authoritarian state recognizes that gender-based struggle is not a side issue, but actually at the center of challenging authoritarianism. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, now, of course, we go back a little bit to a different topic, but later on we can open the discussion, you know, and, and see in which direction we want to take it. But I would like you, Nizar, now to, to go back to neoliberal policies and elaborate a bit how, how they also impact on social movements. Why, why is the, the success of, of, of uh, social movements really limited? Okay, um, I think before talking about the impact, uh, I'd like to talk about neoliberalism in Lebanon, just to give an idea of how the system um, works uh, in order to understand the impact, I think. So, um, neoliberalism, as always, is uh, just another form of, or just another phase in the history of capitalism that where the financial sector, where finan financialization is exaggerated, takes a much larger space of the economic system. And it was the case in Lebanon, as it was the case in all other countries that had neoliberal transformations. Um, in the case of Lebanon, Lebanon what this meant, uh, really, uh, without going through the whole economic uh, process, it meant uh, that capital accumulation, the accumulation of profits, has transformed from sectors that were um, including, that were partially including um, productive sectors such as industry and agriculture, to sectors that do not produce any added value. Um, and this was based on the neoliberal vision of post-war reconstruction in Lebanon. And I'm talking about 1992 till present. So after the civil war uh, in Lebanon uh, that lasted 15 years, uh, what was needed is a quick reconstruction project. Uh, and neo the neoliberal vision meant that we provide the infrastructure and we remove the obstacles and we let the market do the rest. No real public investment in economic development. The privatization of most important state uh, assets such as uh, telecom or electricity, etc. Plans to privatize, they, they weren't established for many reasons we can discuss later. But what, and instead of economic development, instead of investment, the policy was based on um, bringing in capital flows, bringing in bank, bank deposits to Lebanon, because that's the only way you can have foreign currency if you are not exporting anything. And what this me meant is that the sectors where the working class had been working and organizing uh, in the recent history of Lebanon were sidelined um, for the benefit of sectors that are much less labor intensive, where workers have a much less of a say in how things happen. So the structural power, if we can call it, of workers in the economy was reduced dramatically. And I think the other kind of power was also reduced, which is the power of their organizing itself, the institutions that workers are part of. Because as um, expected, the neoliberal uh, project in Lebanon also included a very fierce crackdown on labor, uh, on organized labor, on, work, on the working class, specifically on the General Federation of, Union, um, of Unions that was really active after the Civil War and that was crushed through repression but also through much smarter strategies um, of infiltrating the unions and then dividing them. Um, what this meant is that the state or the political elite in Lebanon now controls uh, the workers' union as much as it controls the the economic process. Um, and when we, we talk about social movements that are not workers' movements, such as the 2015 movement, um, that are led by the kind of activists that I was talking about, um, wh which I am part of, I'm not like talking about an alien group. Um, so this kind of uh, movements is really absent of any, it's, it, it's, so there is an absence of any real worker 
working class presence or union presence in these movements. And this is what I saw in looking uh, in depth into the movement of 2015. There was no real say for the unions. They were not really present. Uh, it was a largely middle class led um, movement. And it meant also, more importantly than just um, um, my uh, left wing, left wing uh, ideas or projections or what I want the movement to be, you know, it was, it affected strategy, it affected the power of the movement to, um, to challenge the political elite, because if you don't disrupt uh, the system of governance, um, and to disrupt the system of governance, you need to disrupt the economic system. If you can't do that, then you cannot force the ruling elite into any kind of change. And with the, uh, with, with the lack of, of uh, capacity to disrupt the institutions because the workers are not involved en masse, this meant that the other forms of dis disruption that are more soft, like disruption of imagination and disruption of space, were the only available options uh, for the movement. And this meant that uh, the movement can be largely ignored and nothing important will happen, nothing will, will force the ruling elite into any compromise. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Nazar. Um, in, on the same issue, Angela, if you could elaborate a bit and draw on your research on, on uh, Tunisia and, and Egypt, how does neoliberal um, economics affect maybe especially women and, and youth and what, how is, what kind of mobilization is there against those policies? Sure. Um, <clears throat> building on uh, what Nizar was saying, um, I think I wanted to just uh, clarify one particular point and then give a few examples. Hopefully the examples would help. Um, and the point that I wanted to make was about the nature of um, authoritarianism, especially new liberal authoritarianism. Um, the region didn't necessarily have, I mean, there's been forms, changing forms of authoritarianism. So it has not remained the same um, from before the uprising and post uprising. It has changed quite a bit in the last 30 years. Um, and I wanted to point out that the content of authoritarianism, especially new liberal authoritarianism, has been shaped not just by domestic actors, but by international actors, international institutions. And that's not unique to the region. Um, this is a new form that we probably, uh, if you've uh, looked at other places, other cases, you, you might have seen this um, and encountered it. Um, for instance, um, in the 2000s, um, when World Bank representatives would come to Egypt, they would tell policymakers, if you're trying to make um, privatize a particular uh, state sector enterprise, uh, don't announce it to them beforehand, um, workers would mobilize, they'd have protests, whatnot, just do it, do it, and then later on let them know. So they would be ca caught off guard, basically. Um, and so this particular um, way of prescribing how to bring about policy change and how to bring about social change is really um, basically uh, the, the political elite have been told to do it in a secretive, non-transparent way, uh, which is quite anti-democratic. Um, and so uh, we don't really talk about this much, but it is really um, uh, reviving authoritarianism, uh, ha you know, basically fused with new liberal policies in the region, which closes the space for uh, democratic accountability by citizens of the region. And really, um, then the responsibility is shared across the board, um, not necessarily just on the political elite um, in these countries. So that's one point I wanted to make. Um, and then, Thinking about this moment, this current moment, I've been doing some research and writing on Tunisia and Egypt recently. Um, some of the challenges, and you mentioned uh, the impact of it on youth and women, um, in general, working class people, peasants, um, they, are, um, they are finding themselves um, under very rigid um, socioeconomic conditions within which they're trying to make a living. Uh, like I mentioned earlier on, the region has a, a major portion of its population in a very young age um, group. And the jobs that have been created oftentimes um, are really uh, short-term contracts, low wage, um, and oftentimes in exor export processing zones. Um, if you think about the case of Morocco, for instance, um, in the treaties they have signed with um, Mediterranean countries, Spain um, and others, uh, these are zones that are created for um, uh, textile workers, for instance, and oftentimes they only recruit women for these jobs because these are really low paid jobs and women are, um, according to their perception, easily controllable, so they will not be able to unionize, for instance. Um, 
the other jobs that are created in the case of Egypt and Tunisia and Morocco, Algeria, these are energy intensive, which are capital intensive. Um, so a lot of machinery involved, but not necessarily um, people being hired there. So very few people get hired in these sectors, whether it's mining, gas, um, energy, uh, solar energy, all of these are very capital intensive. So that's another important feature of jobs that have been created by the private sector. Um, so in so many ways, uh, under neoliberal authoritarianism, we see this particular proposals of policies that don't really match with the needs of the people in the region. Um, and surprisingly, uh, there's not enough room for uh, contestation, for input from the people who are being affected by this. Um, having said that, um, I actually wanted to make one more point that a lot of these youth who are um, not having the jobs then end up leaving, migrating from the region. Um, and so if you Google now or YouTube, you find a lot of songs um, and short clips, uh, a lot of artistic expression of, um, I guess, exasperation by the youth that are coming out in artistic way youth who are leaving from Algeria, from Tunisia, um, from Morocco, who are trying to find uh, another chance at life, basically, another chance and another chance of hope. Um, and this is where, again, f I guess for Europe it's quite important because EU has been, in the recent times, uh, trying to manage its migration policy by pushing its own border further and further uh, on North Africa. And just recently they signed a deal with Egypt. Okay. Angela, just a few things. Um, they signed this deal with Egypt where they have, uh, Egypt has accepted in return for aid package to establish um, refugee and migrant centers so that they can stop them from coming to EU. And then there are other cases that we could look at. Sorry, you said yeah. my time is up. Yeah. Okay, but so because yeah, yeah, yeah we, we just don't have so much time, so we we're covering a lot of really big topics, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a quick time, and uh, so I, I just want to make sure that we have enough time, you know, uh, to to discuss. Yeah. To mention the examples of different movements that are emerging to resist all of this, maybe because I don't I, I don't want to depress you all. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, so a, a range of a range of movements. <laughs> sorry, I'm just. A range of movements have emerged that I'm really interested in, and uh, they're being studied now, and they have since the uprisings. Um, there's a massive movement for food sovereignty and peasants' right, uh, rights and independent unions that are moving away from capitalist ways of producing food, uh, where social justice is at the heart of it. And I can, if you're interested, I could speak to you um, in detail about that, but uh, that's something that's happening. There's another massive movement uh, for environmental rights. Uh, so basically, citizens um, mobilizing, shutting down mines, preventing the waste of water, which is a scarce resource in the region, and basically putting on the agenda what they think is important uh, for the people in the region, like what kind of development they want. And this is really grassroots mobilization and a different kind of, I guess, popular democracy that's um, emerging. Uh, definitely hopeful signs of it um, across the region that we can find. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, that was, as you said, now more on, on, on a positive note, and, but we've talked a lot about crisis. But one thing we discussed also during the last two days or what was actually what motivated us to do this conference is really to to think about new forms of, of transnational also solidarity. So this is now one question I wanna ask Said also what 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 do you see? What what is there a need? What is what would you want from the German left? Let's Me? put it like this. What's what is what is there? What is the hit you what can you see as a Syrian activist in Germany. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, I would like to start this by also pointing out that people, uh, because of the media, mainly because of the media, that it's controlled mostly by right wing, think that Syria, when they think of Syria, they think of deserts, bombs, and dead people. While actually Syria is like uh, so civilized, there's uh, hundreds of small, uh, hundreds of thousands of small villages, and a few, a few dozens of big cities. And Syria have been uh, so uh, uh, into a um, uh, huge number of people are into m middle class, even if it's a low middle class. And people tend to forget that and think that Syria is all about war and all about fighters. What? Uh, and, and how you can go on for like almost seven years depending only on fighters. We tend to forget that there's a civil community that is active, like it's super active because there is no government. Like literally there is no government and not just that, the government is fighting you, so there is uh, 
you have to find alternative for everything. And to find, to think about that, you have to think about basic stuff from for the beginning. You have to think about food, water, electricity, and then you have to think also about medical. Uh, and this is a very important uh, uh, struggle, especially under war. And you have also to think about uh, 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 teaching and also the other kind of uh, civil active, uh, activism inside the society that have been uh, doing what I can call that it's a natural selection system of during the last uh, uh, seven years that people have tested things and when they fail they turn to other theories and keep testing until one thing uh, really works and then develop it and uh, we, re we really tend to ignore all of that and focus on war because war is exciting while this is boring and also siege have contributed too much to uh, improving people's skills, like for example, I have been living for four and a half years in Eastern Ghouta, seized by the regime, and I saw f uh, by my own eyes how people without any uh, parties, without any leadership, they mobilize, and then they have, they have to mobilize to, to stay alive, and then they inventing new ways. And then uh, uh, they, they started very simple by like mobilizing every and each neighborhood, get representatives representative for that, then get representative for a city, and then get representative for all the area. And Eastern Ghouta was like a very big sieged area, was the biggest sieged area in Syria. We are talking about five major cities and uh, about 50 village in the biggest uh, size of uh, Eastern Ghouta that have been fallen little by little, little by little. But during those eight years, we saw firsthand how people really act on their own without any support because all the support goes for armies, both, bo both sides, and most of the people forget about the civil society and focus more about on the individual activist, activists, especially outside of Syria. And, uh, and I'm sad to say that if we're going to talk about solidarity, we have to really think like literally, we have to sit and rethink how what, what the left wing have been doing the past eight years. What I see is have been doing is have been doing whatever he can, just to have an excuse when someone asks, "What are you doing?" Not really thinking about as a real helpful or a real solutions on the ground, and they avoid to talk to people on the ground because most of the people that stayed in Syria are the less educated people and the less uh, wealth people, while the most educated and most wealth people like left Syria from the beginning. And those who left Syria from the beginning actually uh, was living on what I call uh, the tumor of NGOs all around Syria. That main concern of those NGOs nowadays is to still stay exist, not to find a, term, a permanent solution for anything. To talk about that, also we have we tend to forget that agriculture is grow very uh, extraordinary in Syria because if you don't farm, especially in sieged areas, you don't eat. And uh, also uh, we tend we tend to also think about the area in terms of parties countries and politics, while uh, the real help, the real solidarity will be talking to those civil activists inside Syria that are still moving and still doing, like for example, they have a very uh, impressive uh, ways of, uh, of preparing for protests and then organizing the protests, like um, we had, like um, I told you already, 104 points of protests that go out simultaneously, because I say simultaneously, because there is no real parties in Syria. There is no uh, re re leadership that say that in this day we have to mobilize. No, they are move most of the people are simple people moved by simple uh, motives and simple goals and which to them it's to remove Bashar from the government. And you have to understand that to them, this is the number one issue. Uh, we need also to think how to stop uh, the UN, because UN is like nowadays is like 30% of the income for this for, for Bashar regime. We have to also think about how uh, how Russia is pushing Bashar to uh, 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 re-legalized system, and we also have to think about how uh, to push uh, and stop the governments of EU, especially from accepting Bashar back, and he's someone that have. There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of actual documents that indicate that he's a criminal of war. But we tend to forget this because he's a key balance for some huge powers. 
Um, and it's a very big topic. I think we can de dig deep to it in the Q&A mm. because yeah. it's already finished my time, as yeah. usual. <laughs> as usually. Okay.